know what we hear in the lovely little town of New York. The Empire City. What we think of that. Let's hear it. Uh, uh, excuse me, San Francisco. Uh, that does not necessarily represent the views of the management. Unfortunately, you are suffering the results of true democracy, which, as we know, can be a pain sometimes in the you-know-what, because when you get democracy, you get a lot of guys hollering. Shame. Shame. Yeah. All right, now. All right, gang, all together now. Let's send greetings to that lovely metropolis to the north of us here, that bastion of tolerance, that recognized leader of culture in these United States, Boston. Boston, I, I, I don't know what to say. Just to give you an idea how rotten mankind is Boston, we are now participating in a genuine laboratory experiment here. We're broadcasting from New York, and now all of you here in the limelight here in friendly Greenwich Village, <laughs> uh, let's give our hometown a cheer and tell us what we think of our hometown, New York. Well, I don't know exactly what to say. <laughs> Everywhere you look, you see dissatisfaction. <laughs> yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, the other day I'm walking past the United Nations, the UN. This is the bastion of hopes and dreams. You ever looked at the UN in the bright sunlight? And you know, it stands up there overlooking the East River. And it's all the hopes and dreams of Mankind poured into this ugly building, stands up there looking down, and you walk past it, and you can, if you can get through the pickets. <laughs> and the other day, I'm walking past the UN, you know, and I'm very innocent. I'm over there on First Avenue, and I'm walking along. I see all the flags shining in the sun, and the flag poles are banging away there, you know. I'm walking along, and here's a bunch of guys picketing. And one guy is standing right at the head of the pickets, and he's got a beard, he's angry looking. He's got a big sign, and he's walking along, you know, with that, you know, this kind of walk. He's holding it up, and the cars are going past them, and all the clutches are looking out, and they're reading the sign, you know, and they're driving their, they're driving their Mustangs along, and I'm looking out. He's got the sign. This is a picket walk, you know. And I stop there and I look at it. See, and I'm trying to get a look at a sign. He keeps going around and I see all of a sudden what it says. It says, love. And I say, by George. Here's a guy. You know, that's an interesting premise. And so I walk along with him for a while. I look at the sign. He's walking along and he's looking at me. You know, gives me a look. And I say, that's a fascinating premise. That that sign is, is based on a premise that he's got it and nobody else has. See, so I walk up to him and I say, hey, Mac, you know, I'm trying to catch up with him. I say, hey, Mac, hey, Mac, you figure you got a stranglehold on love? Hey, what are you, fascist? <laughs> he's got the sign, see, and I says, no, no, I'm not a fascist, Mac. I happen to be a Rotary Club member. I don't know what your religion is, but you got a sign that says love. Well, now, what about that love? I, I got a little love going here. He says, oh, yeah. I said, yeah. Got a sign say like that. We're going back and forth. Thirty-five of us in the line, you know. He's got the big sign. I says, well, look, Mac, I'll put my love up against yours any day. He says, oh, yeah, fascist. Love a lover. I says, I don't even know Orville Faubus. I only know one guy named Orville. Orville Schmidlap. Who's Faubus? Smart guy. 
back and forth. He goes like this, see? And I said, all right, I'll put my love against yours any day. He stopped. He's a smart guy. Woo! Down I come. And then I realized he had more love than I did. I was unarmed. But these are great moments in mankind's revelation. You know, you begin to understand things after a while, and you begin to understand that inside of each one of us, down that little backbone we got, there's all kinds of wires. And each one of those wires carries another message. Nobody knows exactly the nature of what these messages are. The perceptions, the feelings, the passions, those things that go to make up this magnificent creature, the human being. I, I wonder if, if we could somehow understand it, if the, if the squirrels have pickets with little signs that say love. If we could read the signs. <laughs> well, I happen to know something about old Shep. And I'll never forget, you know, we, 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 watch, we watch these. How many of you have watched Dictators? You know, you see them on the screen. Hardly anybody ever sees a Dictator. Have you ever really seen one? You see them on the screen. And you'll see this little flickering image. And then you'll hear Huntley Chinkley. What, what's his name? Brinkley Cunkley? <laughs> You know, these two account executives that give us the news every night. And Huntley says today, Today, uh, Dave. <laughs> Davey. Hi, Dave. Uh, today, Dave, uh, Premier Castro of Cuba addressed the Cuban people. We have a film here of him about to make a statement. You see this fantastic bearded face. And you hear, Come on, amigos! Arabamara, peace, Kamara! You hear the crowd going, whoa! Wow, what a thing. Wouldn't you love to be a dictator? I mean, seriously, wouldn't you like to stand up on, the, on a balcony? And there, down below you, one million people. Little tiny grains of sand stretching all the way to the horizon. And there you are. Charlie Applerot. And your picture's on every postage stamp. And underneath it, it says, El Benefactorissimo. Our benefactor. Me, Charlie. Yes, sir, Bob. Well, we sit here and laugh, see, because we don't think it's in us. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened to me one time. The only time I've ever had that sense of being a genuine dictator. Fantastic power. Now, the only place where most of us in the ordinary workings of life will ever get a taste of this is in places like the army. <laughs> Hear the ex-second lieutenants laughing in this crowd? Each one of him regretting the days that he took those bars off and went back to the mail room. <laughs> oh yes, indeed. I'll never forget the fantastic feeling of success I had one day when an ex-lieutenant colonel fitted me for a pair of loafers <laughs> and kept calling me sir. And I kept saying, they're tight in the heel, Mac. <laughs> I knew he was a lieutenant colonel, you know. Yeah, by George. We all got it inside us. And one time, I'm this GI, see, I want to tell you a little thing that happened to me. It's a true story. I think I've only told it once on the air. Because one day, they're going to catch up with me and it's, forget it. <laughs> you know, these are some things you don't talk about. <laughs> and I, I'm a GI, see. And I'm hanging around the, I'm hanging around the USO. And the USO is in Washington, D.C. See, I'm just there for a brief stay with my little sorry company. We have been sent there for special training. We were in a screwdriver repair patrol. <laughs> and my little outfit was fixing handles. We were learning how to fix the handles and stuff. It's a very highly secret outfit there. 
and, and uh, we were taking special training. So every night I would go down to the USO. Well, now you never know who you're going to meet in Washington. There's this beautiful girl. And I keep seeing her. And one thing led to the next, and we started to have dates. And I, by this time, I've been in the Army long enough, you know, my uniforms are all neatly tailored. I've made PFC, I've come up the hard way. I got my good conduct ribbon, you know, that shows they never caught me. I was able to fake it. I've got my little badge that says expert, and underneath it it says rifle, bazooka, bubble gum, you know, various things I was expert in, you know. So I was, you know, I was really feeling like I was right on top of it. And I was assigned to Washington. Now, wartime Washington, you couldn't believe it. It was just fantastic. I mean, you know, they talk about Babylon. They talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know, that reminds me, I just thought of something. We all know what happens in Sodom, but what happens in Gomorrah? <laughs> they never told me about that. This guy must be fantastic. See? <laughs> they were so terrible, they didn't even mention it in the Bible. They were just. <laughs> that was censored right out, you know? So here it is, you know, it's Washington, I'm walking around, I got my PFC's pay in my pocket, you know, four dollars and a half, and <laughs> playing it big. And <laughs> I go down, I play ping pong with her, you know, I'm a great left-handed ping pong player, you know, thing, thing, you know, this playing, you know, I'm getting big. And so finally our little relationship had ripened. It had ripened to the point where we would, we would walk in the park, and we would go to restaurants. I'll never forget the fantastic moment of embarrassment when I sat in this restaurant. You know, out in the Midwest, they don't know from seafood. And in fact, the idea of seafood in the Midwest is a puna loaf made with celery and breadcrumbs. We would have seafood that, on that night, tuna, sometimes salmon if my dad was feeling really rotten, you know. That was seafood. And so I go to the seafood restaurant with this girl. It's a big place called the Mermaid. You know, we go there. Ah, you know, I like seafood. I like, you know, I like salmon loaf and that stuff. So we also we also went big in the Midwest for dried haddock. You ever had dried haddock? I mean, I you know, it's a fantastic. So I I had this idea. The Midwest is a really deprived area. And, and, and every time we saw pictures of people eating lobsters. We always had the feeling out there that they were eating spiders. My mother used to say, oh, I couldn't eat a spider. Ooh. So naturally, you know, there, there was a definite anti-seafood area. So this chick said, let's go to the best restaurant in the area, seafood restaurant. So said, okay. So we sit down in this restaurant and I pick up the menu and they had all these things like Oh, a blue point, little necks, cherry stone. I know what this stuff is. I don't even know what they are. And it said clams. Gee. I mean, clams. We used to call clams things we'd see in the street. Got pretty, you know. I know it's bad taste, but it's the Midwest, friend. That also was referred to as the oyster. You know, I can't see myself actually eating this stuff. Wow, you know, gee, clams, all that. And then they had, they had things like, oh, uh, lobsters. And then I hit the one thing that I recognized. The one thing. I said to her, uh, the man comes over, you know, we're both sitting there. And she orders something like little necks on the half shell. I didn't realize that they come awful strong. Four dollars I've got to play with. So she says, little necks on the half shell, and I think I'll have, uh, I think I'll have some Alaskan king crab. Well, that word had an interesting connotation in the army, too. <laughs> You'll have to explain it to her later. Maybe she knows, but hasn't been told yet. <laughs> <laughs> Quit hissing, will you? I'm sorry, honey. I can give you a prescription. It's all right. <laughs> so, so 
I'm sitting there at the table, and I've got this big menu, you know, and, and the man's waiting for me to order, and I, there's one thing I recognize. Scallops. I said, I'll have some scallops. And he said, well, all right, will you have, will you have potatoes with that? Back home, scallops are potatoes. <laughs> Already I'm backing up, you know. I said, I'm ad living. I said, <laughs> well, uh, <I'm> not... <laughs> I said, so, yeah, yeah, uh, potatoes. He said, well, how will you have them? French fried? Will you have them baked or scallops? <laughs> well, I'll... <laughs> I'll have them French fried. And I'm sitting there worried now, you know, and about 10 minutes later, these little fried golf balls arrive. <laughs> and this girl is saying things to me like, uh, gee, you know, the scallops are very good here. This is the time of year for them. This is the best year for them. <laughs> and there they were in front of me. And you know the strange thing about it? I took one scallop and I was hooked. And ever since that time, everywhere I go, seafood. But seafood, you see, re means more to me than scallops. It means what happened the next day. I played it big, see. And she said to me about halfway through the meal, I was enjoying it. Had my scallops, my french fries. Uh, she didn't discover we were, you know, I'm a tuna fish man. I'm faking it up big. And she says, say, would you like to come out to my, to my aunt's house over the weekend? I am going there, and how would you like to go with me? It's in the country. Would you like to go with me? I said, yeah, i got a pass. I'd love to. Wow. A weekend in the country. Do you know that in Indiana, the country means the dumps? <laughs> And all the time, you know, since I'm a kid, I've been reading stories about weekends in the country. And it has a whole connotation, you know, Cary Grant, and guys wearing blazers, guys with tennis rackets, you know, and all this stuff. I'm a PFC, see, weekend in the country. And so she said, all right, I'll tell you, we will pick you up tomorrow, and we will drive down to the railroad station, and we'll take the train. It's in northern New Jersey. That's a long way, you know. I said, yeah, well, fine. You know, my idea is, is to get in, the, in, the, in my dad's Oldsmobile, you know, and drive to the forest preserve. <laughs> That's the country, you know, where you sit around and you roast potatoes and you come back. This is a big deal. So I said, gee, uh, going up to New Jersey, I've never been to New Jersey. She said, well, it's lovely. It's a town called Morristown. <laughs> Well, now, now, in those days, Morristown was lovely, Fred. <laughs> but ever since Howard Johnson came, of course, things... So, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'm all excited about this. And the next day, they pick me up, and we drive down to the railroad station, and I'm sitting in the train with her mother, who is a very, very, very dignified lady. And, you know... It, it's funny, I could see, now looking back on it over these years, I can see she was feeling me out. Because this chick, you know, she had the look in the eye. You know that hungry look, men? You've all seen that look. You know that look that says, here I am. It's going to cost you. <laughs> Like it's going to cost the rest of your life, you know. And she had that look, see, and, and the mother sensed it, you know. There was this whole big thing going. We're sitting in the car there, and in, in the train, we're opposite each other in the seats. And I'm wearing my PFC uniform. It's sharp and clean. I'm all pressed. And this lady is sitting over here next to me, and we're looking out of the window at the countryside going by, and the chick is sitting opposite me in her flowered dress with a hungry look. And this, this woman is, 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 she's asking me questions, you know, they sounded very innocent. Like she says, is your mother having 
the same difficulty we're having in Washington, the servant problem. <laughs> now, that sounds like I'm making it up. She honestly asked me if my mother was having a servant problem. Well, I don't know whether you know my mother. If anything, my mother was having a slave problem. And she was it. <laughs> You know, and, and, and she says, is she having a servant problem? And I said, well, it's not as bad in the Midwest. I knew it was a loaded question. I didn't want to say yes. I didn't want to say no. I could see the quicksand up around my ankles already. You know? So I said, well, we don't... <laughs> we, uh, my mother just doesn't tell me about what hell it is on the home front, you know. Doesn't write about those things, but I guess she must be having troubles. She was having troubles. Every night she would have to go and help to ring Mr. Bruner out. You know, the worst thing that happened to Mr. Bruner next door to us was the war came on and he had to go to work. And it's not easy to work when you're drunk. So they would ring him out for the war effort every night, see? So that was my mother's chief problem. So we rode on and on, and this lady is saying nice little things to me all the way, saying things like, uh, do you like the army? <laughs> well, I didn't know what to say, see, because I was funny looking around, and then she says, you know, we come from an army family. <laughs> an army family. <laughs> I guess, you know, I says, well, so do I, you know. Like I'm a PFC, and my brother just made T5. I guess we're an army family. My old man's been running away from the draft for the last year and a half. He's developed a fantastic limp, and he keeps one eye closed and all that, you know. <laughs> so I said, yeah, well, it's army family. So we go on and on in this little casual conversation, and she's getting kind of to like me. I can sense that, you know. She, she senses the buffoon, you know. And so we're going a little further on. And we come now to Morristown, New Jersey. And we walk off the train, and it is one of those beautiful days that Jersey has once every 15 years. Yeah, it was a beautiful day. The sun is shining. And we step out on the platform. And I had come from the Midwest. Remember that. And our idea of suburbs is just where the used car lots begin. <laughs> Those are the suburbs. Endless miles of used car lots and junkyards, <laughs> vacant lots, and once in a while a little gray house in the middle of it, the big gas tank. Those are the suburbs. And I didn't know that suburbs had trees. And you know, I, I was amazed. I got out and here are the trees. It's a beautiful town. I could smell the air it was clean and magnificent and we walk through this tree-lined street and we arrive at the house now this house how many of you know the kind of houses they have in certain areas of New Jersey like all like deal <laughs> have you seen some of those places <laughs> they're fantastic 19th century monstrosities you know they always have a name like Murchison's Folly <laughs> and in 1887 this robber baron built this fantastic house and he kept adding wings onto it and horns and bugles <laughs> and he had great big wooden parachutes and trees <laughs> and big bold windows with virgins in it and all that you know and it became known as Murchison's Folly well here I am standing in front of Murchison's Folly in you know, a fantastic place and it's extremely elegant, beautiful time. Oh, by the way, before we go any further, what radio station are you listening to, gang? Oh, come on. If there's anything I hate, it's bad ad-libbing. Now, I'm going to tell you how to ad-lib funny. Radio Moscow is not funny. Had you said Radio Free Yugoslavia, or Radio Free Bronx. <laughs> Poor slob. Let's give him a hand. 
You better hide under the coat. He's got those rimless glasses with that CCNY glow. <laughs> By the way, this guy over here in the corner says, never fool with the pros. Coleslaw. Would you like a little mayonnaise on your ears, friend? <laughs> So, you know, here it is. I'm in Morristown, New Jersey, see, and it's very proper and polite, and I meet the aunt. And she is a lovely woman. Really lovely, you know. She's the kind of lady that was married in the movies that I used to see to Lewis Stone. Do you remember, do you remember Andy Hardy's mother? She's kind of Faye Bader cubed. This lady, she's got a motherly, gentle, very, very... Oh, civilized quality to it, see. And so now we're sitting at her, her table. First time in my life, we are having a dinner that is served by servants in Morristown, New Jersey. You can hardly credit your senses, but you'd be surprised what's going on in some of those dens of iniquity. Just outside the main stem, just past the Manny Mo and Jack stores. There it is, see? And so we're sitting there and we're eating and I'm trying to pick the right forks. It's kind of nice out. And now I see outside the door and outside the window there's a gentle rain beginning to come down. It's raining. It's a soft summer day. The rain is coming down. And it's getting a little tough, you know. The rain is coming down harder and harder. And so we finish our meal. And I'm sitting next to this lovely girl who is my date, you know. We're sitting there. And here's her aunt. And there over there is her mother. And they begin to talk about the uncle who is in the army. Woo! And the aunt says, you know, James is in the army too. And I said, well, it's a lot of dog faces. A lot of us are in the army. She says, yes, James was very glad to go. He felt that he had a duty. And I certainly admire all of you who've gone. And we're sitting there. It's one of those embarrassing things. And you know, we're sort of sitting in the living room. And, and this girl and I wanted to get off by ourselves. Just do anything. Just be by ourselves. Walk, you know. And finally the aunt said, why don't you two young people, why don't you go down to the A and P, which is open tonight till nine. Why don't you go down to the A and P, take a little walk, and get some ice cream? We'll have a little party, and you. And I could see she's saying to us, "Go on and split, see." And so I, oh great, you're a great gal, see. So I says, "Yeah." <laughs> the chick next to me says, "Yes, It'd be nice." I have got no raincoat. I am there in my PFC suntans. It was a beautiful day. I have not brought my raincoat. And it's raining out. And so the aunt says, oh, listen. She says, don't worry about that. James has left one of his raincoats up in the closet. Why don't you go up and get it? It's in the room you're using, you know. That's James's room, so go ahead and get it. So I go upstairs, you know. And it's this beautiful room with, with white with that kind of white gauzy curtain, you know, that flows, that rich people kind of, oh, you know what I mean, Merle Oberon curtains, you know. <laughs> They're kind of billowing out, and it's got little ties and stuff on it. Oh, just fantastic bed with a, with a fluffy stuff. And so I go up to the closet, and I open it up, and here is this other guy, this other G.I.'s clothes hanging there. And I see my own closet back home with the electric blue sport coat hanging there <laughs> waiting for me to come home to take up my post-war swinging life i could see back home my zoot suits you know with the high <laughs> the belts the alligator belts all hanging there waiting for me to come you know my saddle shoes one after the other my fielder's mitt hanging there <laughs> and i i look in this guy's I look in this guy's closet, and here he's got hanging all these gray suits. 
these beautiful gray flannel suits are all hanging there. And I see these black shoes all shine, just waiting for James to return home. And I see his sport coat. He was the kind of guy, you know, that has these tweed coats with the leather things at the elbow. Where I come from, that means you're poor. <laughs> Somehow that coat didn't look worn, you know, but it had things, leather things. It had little twigs growing out of it, you know. And then there was a, there was a jacket, there was a blue jacket. I'll never forget this, it was a blue jacket with little silver buttons. And it had over the pocket here a big shield with a horse. And underneath it, there were Latin words. You know, like, in the hock of Wicula Conk, in s equitation clunk. <laughs> you know, he was, a, he was a horseman. I look in there, and I could smell the leather and this beautiful clothes coming out. And way over on this end, there is hanging an O.D. raincoat. A full-length O.D. raincoat. And I take the thing out, you know, I put it on. It's just about my size. He's exactly my height. I put this thing on. It's, you know, it's just an old D raincoat. It's, it's got a kind of a funny feel, though. It's got a belt. Mine never had a belt. I put the belt around. I stand in front of the mirror, and I look. Instinctively, I snap to attention. Instinctively, my gut goes going. The little fear comes in my eyes. I am looking at a brigadier general. I had not noticed on the on these little on these little shoulder straps there are sewn sewn. Get it? Two little embroidered silver stars. One on each shoulder. Well, I have my GI hat, you know, with the orange braid all around it. I look in the picture in the mirror, and I must tell you, friends, <laughs> it was a great feeling. I would like to say that I said to myself, no, you are one of them. You are one of the noble men. You are one of the boys. No, there was that instant that said, Shep, at last you've hit your true level. <laughs> and it was another voice that said, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and a pig, you know what. And I'm standing there, see, and I'm in Jim's, old Jim, you know. I'm in Jim's coat. And I said, For crying out loud, this guy's a, a brigadier general. And I've got a straight. G.I. Enlisted Man PFC hat. Well, I go back to the closet, and I look in there, and up on the top, there are about three big hats with the things, you know? And I've always had that terrible desire to just see what they feel like, you know? Just to put one on. And I reach up there. You know, they, they've got a sweatband, just like a real hat. You know, I, I had thought up to that time that, that officers didn't sweat. <laughs> what do they need a sweatband? You know, I, I thought that officers didn't do a lot of things we did. <laughs> yeah, you get these little ideas, you know, when you're a PFC and long enough. And I take that hat and I put it on. Boy, it's my size. Seven and one eighth. I lay it down there, snap it to. I am practicing giving an officer's salute. You know, I just little... That's a general salute. You know, that's that look. And I'm, I'm walking around in front of this full-length mirror. It's raining out. And downstairs, I hear the girl calling up the stairwell. She says, let's go, it's getting late. Now I had a decision. What to do? Well, I did it. 
I am now downstairs. Stars. Eagle. Underneath PFC. <laughs> oh, what a moment. It sounds like I'm inventing it. I'm telling you, it's, a, it's, it's the truth. This is a true story. I get downstairs and the lady says, oh, you're just the same size as James. <laughs> Your coat fits, doesn't it? You know, there are some ladies that are so things are done, you know. You know? <laughs> that say yard bird on them, you know? <laughs> she said, it looks very nice. And I says, well, you don't mind if I wear Jim's hat, do you? She says, no, it looks very nice on you. I said, yes, I think so. And uh, this girl, she doesn't know from nothing, you know? She's a, she's a USO girl, so she's nice. A true debutante type, you know? <laughs> So now we are out on the street. It's raining. It's drifting down. And I am surprised to note that officers' raincoats work. <laughs> Which was a twist. I had never seen a, a, an army raincoat work. My raincoat was like a sieve, a strainer. It just strained out the bigger lumps of crud, you know. It filtered the water that came in on you. So this is a great raincoat. I'm walking along the street, you know, with Effie. She got her hand. I'm like, you know, we're walking down under the trees. And it's Morris Town. I, you know, it's, it's a quiet town. I figure there's nothing going to happen. It's just going to be one of those great moments. We're on our way to the A&P. I mean, a brigadier general going to the A&P, see? <laughs> well, they eat for crying out loud. They eat too. I mean, they got to go and eat and do out of all the stuff. So I'm on the way to the A&P. So I go in through the door. And by this time, you know, I'm all involved with it. You know, we're swinging. I'm talking and we're, we're jabbering it up. And I begin to forget. It's funny how quickly you just, you know, forget this thing. So I walk into the A&P and there's about, oh, you know, a couple of dozen people all walking around. There's a bunch of them back here in the beer department, the frozen food department. An old chef walks in. And you can hear the music coming out. You know, they got a record player. I walk in there, I'm looking at the cheese, the cheese trailing behind me, and I'm whispering little words of love in her ear, you see. We recognize this is the only time we're going to get a face. And so back over there in the baked ham department, back in the delicatessen division, I'm getting real close to her, see, and I say, hey, baby, how about later? And she goes, hee, 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 hee. <laughs> And I noticed this guy, I noticed the guy back there with the slicer. He's looking at me. This is the first time he's seen a brigadier general trying to make the scene. <laughs> you know, he could hear it. So, so we're walking around back there and there's slicing the meat. And we go back by the ice cream department and there it is. There's the tutti frutti. There's the chocolate and the vanilla. There's all the ice creams. And, and, and the girl says to me, she says, well, what should we have? That's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference when you're in love. I'm trying out all the great lines that I'd heard Andy Hardy use. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. I, I, I must hasten to tell you, at that time, I had just... I had just made the transition from my 17th year to my 18th. I am a cool 18. And about four months before, I had just started to shave. And the way I would shave, I would rub real hard in the morning. And it would go off, see? I was very pink and very fresh. Ah, you... And now we have what we have come for, and we're pushing the little cart out. And we get into the checkout line, and I'm deeply involved with the chick now, see. And we're in the checkout line. They've only, you know, have you ever wondered that great mystery? How come they got so many cash registers? And they've only got two lines? 
Have you ever wondered about all those empty checkout lines? 4,000 people are all waiting in line. And, and there I am. See, I'm in the line. I walk up to the end of the line, and I see this GI. He's standing there. And I walk up, and I'm turning around to talk to the chick, and I look back again, and he snaps, too. He says, yes, sir, yes, sir. Here, you can have my place in line, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, soldier. I have moved up one notch, you know, and he's standing back there looking. This is the youngest brigadier general he's ever seen. This was a staff sergeant who was at least 40. You know, a regular army man, you know, RA. But there I am standing there with my two little stars twinkling my pink cheeks glowing <laughs> and little old ladies are turning you know they say, oh, how are you? <laughs> and now i am back i am i am i'm up to the counter see and, and the kid is standing back there and he's ringing them up and he's got another guy that's bagging the stuff and he takes one look at me and he sees these two stars and he leans forward and he says general sir i'm going to be drafted are there any strings that you could pull for me? <laughs> and I turned to him say, do you... Remember, I am in the handle platoon of a screwdriver repair outfit. <laughs> I say to him, of course, you realize the new modern army is very technical. Requires a certain amount of technical knowledge before I could help you understand that. And I can see this staff sergeant behind me looking at me, and you can just see what he's saying. These damn Air Corps men. <laughs> the first thing that a regular Army man thinks when he sees a high ranking officer of the age of 12, he must be a P 38 colonel who flies a fighter plane. So I'm standing there looking grizzled. And I walk out now with my little thing full of ice cream. And I've got my hamburger that we bought. A few little hors d'oeuvres. Some pickled snails. We're on our way home through the rain. General Shepard is returning from the commissary. <laughs> We're walking along. Now, let me tell you the awful, fantastic moment I see. We are about 15 feet from the house, and I figure I'm going to make it clean. No harm done. No. Just I've just given everybody at the A&P a cheap thrill. <laughs> I've given this staff sergeant a story to tell the guys back in the infantry for the next hundred years about this four-year-old brigadier he saw. <laughs> you know, I figure it's all clean, and I'm walking along with her, and I'm beginning to feel real great, you know. Oh, I, I keep looking, you know, it's great, you know, you ought to see how wonderful it is to look down at the stars instead of looking up, you know, all the time. <laughs> and those hats feel so solid, man. To those of you who have never worn an officer's hat, I'll tell you 99%, I know it now, 99% of their sense of power comes from that hat. <laughs> well, that's true of the cowboys, too. Well, how do you think Gary Cooper would have looked at a beanie? I mean, hats are important, you know. And all they had given me to wear was this little piece of cloth with a little thing on it, you know. But now I've got a big hat that goes up like that. Big stars all over and big eagles shining. And I'm walking along. Now, you've got to see. I am, I am actually consummating one of America's biggest dreams. Faking it. All the way. We are out in front of the house now. You got it? We come up the house like this, it's raining. And I see coming along the street a brown Ford. A brown Ford. And on the side it says USMP. In little block letters. And I see these two guys with these big white hats, you know, and they're driving along. And I'm walking along like this, you see, and I'm walking on the outside. I'm a gentleman, see. And she's on the inside, and all of a sudden I try to get inside, you know, get her out there. 
And with that, I see the guy that's driving. He stops staring, and he's, you know, three times he salutes like that. And I, I throw this little salute, and the guy next to him salutes out the back window, and then I see him talking. I see the guy next to the driver say something, and they start to turn around. Oh, my God. You never saw anything like it. I broke all world records for the hundred yard up the stairs dash done by brigadier generals. I was up the stairs over and into the house like mad that I'm so boy. And she says to me, what's the hurry? I says, I didn't want to get Jim's coat too wet. It's beginning to soak through on the arms. Up the stairs I go and I hang it in there next to those beautiful Brooks Brothers suits. That wet, that wet raincoat. And I take this hat and I put it up there. And all of a sudden, it's gone. I'm standing in front of the mirror. My rumpled GI suit. You know, the bulges out. You could see these two little stripes. One of them was beginning to come off, you know, where the thread was raveling. A little bit. I'm standing there. I've lost a foot and a half in height. At least. I come down the steps. And the lady says, Oh, there's two soldiers here who would like to see you. <laughs> and I said to the girl, I said, Look, quick. She's on the steps with me. And I said, Listen. We haven't been out of the house in a week, got it? <laughs> we haven't been out of the house in a week. And she says, yes, all right, all right. And so we go down the stairs. And here are these two guys, you know, they're with the big white hats, with the armbands. The guy looks at me. I look at him. I say, what do you want? He says, we'd like to see the general. I says, the general? Oh, <laughs> you're not looking for me. Uh... Mrs. Merget, uh, they want to see your husband. And she says, oh, well, I'll have to tell the boys. And she goes to the door and she says, well, my husband, you see, is overseas. <laughs> and she was so nice, you know. And, and, and these two guys stand there, big lantern jaws. <laughs> yeah, sure, lady. <laughs> Is he uh, uh, a general about this size? She says, yes, he is. Well, lady, does he have a little round fat face? She says, no, he has a, he has a gray mustache. And the guys look there, you know, I love the MP mind. It's very literal. <laughs> One of them says, I told you, Chuck. I told you that guy walked like a PFC out of your mind. Stars, you nut. All right, I'm sorry, lady, we made a mistake. And I look back over the shoulders. Yeah, fellas, I just came in with my girl. Okay, Mac. Yeah, all right, Mac. Goes down a step. To, yeah, Mac, okay, Mac. You got a pass, Mac? So, yeah, Mac. <laughs> See, three day Mac. A gym had sat. I sat down there with a big cut crystal ball of tutti frutti. And she poured a little cherry hearing over it. I thought it was cherry syrup. You know, like we used to get back at the big boy drive-in. And I didn't want to say, I didn't want to tell her that her syrup had gone bad. <laughs> and I'm boning it up, you know, I'm sitting there. My little stripes hanging on by a bare thread. My three-day pass in my breast pocket. And this chick next to me. And you know, I, I somehow secretly knew. It's funny how the human animal has instincts about time. 
I somehow secretly knew that I had reached the absolute pinnacle of my life. <laughs> Never again was I to even remotely approach the rank of Brigadier General. I knew it. No matter what kind of definition you use of rank. And I'm sitting there, savoring it. And I look over here, and on the side of, his, of the walls, you know, they've got glass cases with books leather-covered books and there's a bronze statue it's all crumpled and bronze and we, we the kind of statues we had at home were well often the statue that we would see most of was a black leopard with a clock in its gut <laughs> that was our idea of a statue at home you know <laughs> and I see this big piece of bronze and I'm looking up there and I could smell the kitchen. They're fixing a little snack for later on. And I see the maid walking past out there. You know, for that minute, I had an insight into another, a completely alien way of life. The life where people go into the army as generals because it's their duty. <laughs> And here I am sitting on this French love seat. I'm a representative of the rest of the population. We go into the army because they're biting at our hocks. <laughs> we go into the army because a letter arrived that says, Dear friend, your neighbors have elected you as being it. Well, I'm sitting there, you know, and I, I just love this feeling, see. I see the books, and I can smell that kitchen out there. And I can hear the rustle of the maid's uniform. And somebody presses the doorbell off in the distant wing. And it's one of those doorbells that goes boom, boom. It's a rich people doorbell. You know, boom, boom. Our doorbell would go, ah! <laughs> you know, it would just go, ah! And my old man would holler, tell Bruner to beat it! I don't have no time for bowling tonight with a drunk. And I hear this boom, boom. Oh, and I love that feeling. It's just warm and deep. And I felt something, I felt a yearning that we all try to suppress in our workaday lives. Inside of each one of us, believe me, there is a latent dictator, a latent brigadier general, a latent, rotten, spoiled aristocrat. And we never, ever get a chance to achieve it. And so we go through our lives pretending that we've chosen to remain one of the boys. You know, for years I've been saying to people, oh, I didn't go to OCS, I just want to be a, one of the boys. <laughs> oh, boy. So now, before we leave, let us salute all of those who have made it. From those of us who haven't. Let's hear it. All right, if you're going to do it, do it! All right, sore heads. Don't tell me if tonight the phone rang and they said we've been watching you. This is Daryl Zanuck. And we'd like to do your life story with Cary Grant playing it. You'd love it, wouldn't you? A girl said...